70 years ago this week. On November 16, 1953, a letter to Trotskyists throughout the world was published in the Militant, the newspaper of the Socialist Workers' Party, which was then the Trotskyist organization in the United States. Issued in the name of the party's national committee, its author was James P. Cannon, the SWP's 63-year-old national chairman. I should add here that among the signatories of that letter uh, was Jerry Healy, uh, the, who was to play an immensely critical role in the development of the Trotskyist movement uh, within Britain, in the United States, and internationally. The Socialist Workers' Party at the time was not formally affiliated with the Fourth International due to anti-communist laws in the United States. But despite this technical limitation, Cannon's political authority was based on the critical role that he had played in the founding of the international left opposition in 1928, his subsequent close collaboration with Trotsky in the fight for the Fourth International, and the preparation of its founding Congress in September 1938, his central role in the struggle led by Trotsky against the petty bourgeois revisionist tendency of Max Schachmann, James Burnham, and Martin Abern in 1939-40, and in the aftermath of Trotsky's assassination in August 1940, Cannon's unyielding defense in the reactionary environment of World War II and the initial years of the Cold War of the programmatic heritage of the Fourth International. In 1953, Cannon confronted a powerful revisionist tendency in the International Secretariat of the Fourth International, which was then the leadership organization of the FI, represented by Michel Pablo and Ernest Mandel. Pablo is on your right, Mandel on your left, though that picture is taken at a much later stage of their life. The central elements of Pablo's revisionism were the rejection of Trotsky's insistence on the counter-revolutionary nature of Stalinism and the perspective of building the Fourth International as the World Party of Socialist Revolution. Pablo and his acolyte, Mandel, advocated the liquidation of the sections of the Fourth International into the mass Stalinist parties, or depending upon the balance of forces in a given country into the social democratic, bourgeois nationalist, and petty bourgeois radical movements. Within the United States, the followers of Pablo advanced this liquidationist program under the banner <coughs> Junk the Old Trotskyism. They derided Cannon and the veteran leadership of the SWP as museum pieces, whose defense of orthodox Trotskyism was politically irrelevant. Pablo was not merely engaged in a war of words. He utilized his position in the International Secretariat to organize anti-Trotskyist factions in the Fourth International and to expel individuals and even entire sections that opposed his drive to liquidate the Fourth International as an independent revolutionary movement. The political conception that underlay Pablo's war uh, the, uh, that only Pablo's war against the Fourth International was his argument that Stalinism, contrary to the analysis of Trotsky, remained a powerful revolutionary force. Responding to the pressure of the masses and under conditions of a global nuclear war, the Stalinists, he said, would be compelled to take power. The outcome of this process would be the creation of centuries of degenerated worker states that would, over a vast expanse of time, somehow evolve into socialist societies. That this 
Bizarre perspective attracted a substantial following, testified not only to the political disorientation that had developed within the Fourth International in the aftermath of World War II, but also to the growing influence of an increasingly affluent and politically self-conscious petty bourgeoisie engaged in radical left politics. Cannon, facing the danger of imminent organizational liquidation of large sections of the Fourth International, issued what came to be known as the Open Letter. It was a critical, necessary, political initiative in defense of the Fourth International. As he was to say in justification of this decision to those who said he did it too quickly, he says, well, when the shooting starts, the talking stops. Drawing upon his immense political experience, Cannon concisely summarized the foundational principles of the Trotskyist movement as they had developed since 1923. He wrote, and I'm quoting, one, the death agony of, cap of the capitalist system threatens the destruction of civilization through worsening depressions, world wars, and barbaric manifestations like capitalism, like fascism. The development of atomic weapons today underlies the danger in the gravest possible way. Two, the descent into the abyss can be avoided only by replacing capitalism with a planned economy of socialism on a world scale, and thus resuming the spiral of progress opened up by capitalism in its early days. Three, this can be accomplished only under the leadership of the working class as the only truly revolutionary class in society. But the working class itself faces a crisis of leadership, although the world relationship of social forces was never so favorable as today for the workers to take the road of, to power. Four, to organize itself for carrying out this world historic aim, the working class in each country must construct a revolutionary socialist party in the pattern developed by Lenin. That is, a combat party capable of dialectically combining democracy and centralism. Democracy in arriving at decisions, centralism in carrying them out a leadership controlled by the ranks, ranks able to carry forward under fire in disciplined fashion. Five, the main obstacle to this is Stalinism, which attracts workers through exploiting the prestige of the October 1917 revolution in Russia only later as it betrays their confidence to hurl them back either into the arms of the social democracy, into apathy, or back into illusions in capitalism. The penalty for these betrayals is paid by the working people in the form of consolidation of fascist or monarchist forces, and new outbreaks of wars fostered and prepared by capitalism. From its inception, the Fourth International set as one of its major tasks the revolutionary overthrow of Stalinism inside and outside the USSR. Six, the need for flexible tactics facing many sections of the Fourth International and parties or groups sympathetic to its program makes it all the more imperative that they know how to fight imperialism and all of its petty bourgeois agencies such as nationalist formations or trade union bureaucracies, without capitulation to Stalinism, and conversely, know how to fight Stalinism, which in the final analysis is a petty bourgeois agency of imperialism, without capitulating to capitalism. These fundamental principles established by Leon Trotsky retain full validity in the increasingly complex and fluid politics of the world today. 
In fact, the revolutionary situations opening up on every hand as Trotsky foresaw have only now brought concreteness to what at one time may have appeared to be somewhat remote abstractions, not intimately bound up with the living reality of the time. The truth is that these principles now hold with increasing force both in political analysis and in the determination of the course of practical action. Seventy years after its publication, the open letter retains undiminished relevance as a summation of the present political situation and the tasks of the Fourth International, led by the International Committee. Cannon's warning of the use of nuclear weapons and the dangers of fascist barbarism is even more timely, more urgent today than it was in 1953. The one major change that stands out as one reviews these six points is that the Soviet Union no longer exists and the mass Stalinist parties have been swept away. Of course, to the extent that the reactionary class collaborationist, nationalist, and anti-socialist politics of Stalinism persist in new political guises, the obstacle that it represented to the revolutionary movement of the working class has not disappeared. You witness that here in the person of that ghost from the cemetery of Stalinism who goes by the name of Jeremy Corbyn. The working class still confronts the systematic and organized treachery of the trade union bureaucracies, the reactionary organizations that still labor themselves, label themselves labor, social democratic and green, and the innumerable pseudo-left and bourgeois and petty bourgeois nationalist parties and organizations, many of which trace their origins to the Pabloite repudiation of the program of the Fourth International. And so the crisis of revolutionary leadership remains to be resolved. But conditions for its resolution are far more favorable than they were 70 years ago. Absolutely nothing remains, in a serious political sense, of the false and disorienting identification of Stalinism with the heritage and program of the October Revolution. The breakdown of the mass Stalinist movement has vindicated the struggle initiated by Trotsky a century ago with the founding of the left opposition, and it has substantiated the world revolutionary political perspective of the International Committee of the Fourth International. These are political facts of immense significance in the present international crisis of the world capitalist system. Now, we are meeting today amidst the unfolding genocide in Gaza. This is the realization of the, quote, descent into the abyss of which the open letter warned. Capitalism, as Marx wrote, emerged historically, quote, dripping from head to foot from every pore with blood and dirt. And so it will end. Billions of people throughout the world are outraged by the daily atrocities being committed by the Israeli regime with the full support of the imperialist powers. All the hypocritical invocations of human rights employed by the United States and its NATO allies to justify its wars, usually described as humanitarian interventions have been totally exposed and discredited. Every single imperialist leader, Biden in the United States, Trudeau in Canada, Sunak in Britain, Macron in France, Schultz in Germany, Moroni in Italy, all of them are fully implicated as the accomplices of Netanyahu in mass murder. Were war crimes trials to be held, and one day they will be, 
these individuals not, would not be able to claim, as some of the Nazi ringleaders ludicrous, ludicrously attempted at Nuremberg, that they were not aware of the atrocities being committed by the Israeli Zionist regime. Not only are they aware of these crimes, they have repeatedly, publicly justified and even welcomed them. As of November 16th, just two days ago, the death of 11,500 people in Gaza had been confirmed, including at least 4,710 children. The rate at which Palestinian children are now being killed is orders of magnitude higher than any other conflict in this young and already very bloody 21st century. In addition, more than 29,800 Palestinians have been injured. Deprived of communications facilities, the Gaza Health Ministry has stopped counting the casualties. Since October 7th, Israeli attacks have murdered on average 320 Gazans every single day. If that rate has continued through today, the number of dead is likely to be well over 13,000. Of this total, more than half will be women and children. The carpet bombing of Gaza has destroyed or damaged 40% of northern Gaza's homes and shattered its health care, food distribution, and water treatment facilities. Clearly, war crimes under international law. And while the violence of the Israeli military machine has been directed mainly against the people of Gaza, the army and fascist settlers have murdered approximately 175 Palestinians on the West Bank. Of the genocidal character of the Israeli onslaught, there is no question. They are confirmed by the explicit statements of Israeli leaders, establishing intentionality if the question arises in a court of law. National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gvir has stated that anyone who supports Hamas should be eliminated. Amihai Eliyahu, a coalition partner of Netanyahu and Israel's def heritage minister, said that dropping a nuclear bomb on Gaza should be an option. Galit Distel Atbarian, until recently Israel's information minister, presumably in charge of official lying, demanded the erasure of, quote, all of Gaza from the face of the earth and forcing its people into exile in Egypt. At the end of October, Craig Muckybeer stated as he resigned from his post as director of the New York Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. This is a textbook case of genocide. The European ethno-nationalist settler colonial project of Palestine has entered its final phase toward the expedited destruction of the last remnants of indigenous Palestinian life in Palestine. What's more, the governments of the United States, the United Kingdom, and much of Europe are wholly complicit in this horrific assault. Volker Turk, the United Nations Commissioner for Human Rights, stated in Geneva, and I quote, there has been a breakdown of the most basic respect for humane values. The killing of so many civilians cannot be dismissed as collateral damage. The raid on Al-Shifa Hospital, which the Netanyahu regime had claimed would expose its use by Hamas as a center of military operations, has shades of the refrain, weapons of mass destruction, 
it has only yielded further evidence of Israel's crimes against humanity. In the face of irrefutable daily visual evidence of unrestrained violence against the civil, civilian population, the imperialist powers have repeatedly and emphatically opposed calls for a ceasefire. No ceasefire has become the homicidal war cry of the allies of the Israeli regime. In its place, the experts in euphemisms of the United States government and its NATO allies have invented the calming phrase, humanitarian pause. A remarkable way of describing the reloading of weapons and the recalibrating of targets by the Israeli military forces. The Israeli government and its imperialist backers justified the genocidal rampage as a legitimate response to the raid launched by Hamas on October 7th. Let us first of all point out that there has been no formal investigation into the events of that day. There is no exact count of the number of deaths, let alone how the victims lost their lives. There is no reliable information on how many Israeli victims died at the hands of Hamas and how many died because of the massive retaliation of the Israeli military. Moreover, among the unanswered questions relate to the extent that the Netanyahu government, looking for a pretext for an attack on Gaza, deliberately overlooked intelligence information indicating that some sort of operation was being planned by Hamas. While it is certainly possible that the Netanyahu regime did not anticipate the scale of the incursion into Israel, it is certainly hard to believe that Israel's intelligence agencies, whose agents operate throughout Gaza and the West Bank, were entirely oblivious of Hamas's preparations for a major military operation. More information will surely emerge. But the Israeli regime's attempt to justify its present actions as an appropriate response to what occurred on October 7th is fundamentally deceitful and, to be blunt, largely beside the point. Its attempt to justify its assault on Gaza as legitimate retaliation for the attack launched by Hamas is nothing other than the arguments employed throughout history by oppressors to justify their crushing of the resistance of the oppressed. If I may be permitted to cite from the lecture that I gave last month at the University of Michigan, the death of so many innocent people is a tragic event. But the tragedy is rooted in objective historical events and political conditions that made such an event inevitable. As always, the ruling classes oppose all references to the causes of the uprising. Their own massacres and the entire bloody system of oppression over which they preside so ruthlessly must go unmentioned. Why should anyone be surprised that decades of oppression by the Zionist regime led to an explosive eruption of anger? It has happened in the past and as long as human beings are oppressed and brutalized, it will happen in the future. Those who suffer oppression cannot be expected during a desperate rebellion when their own lives hang precariously in the balance to treat their tormentors with tender-hearted courtesy. Such rebellions are often marked by acts of cruelty and bloody vengeance. Many examples come to mind. The Sepoy Mutiny in India, the uprising of the Dakota Indians against the American settlers, the rebellion of the boxers in China, of the Hereros in Southwest Africa, and in more recent time, the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya against British colonial rulers. In all these cases, the insurgents were denounced as heartless murderers 
and demons and subjected to brutal retribution. Decades, if not a century or more, had to pass before they were belatedly honored as freedom fighters. Some of those people, like Nelson Mandela, went on to become presidents of their country and even were awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. As for the calculated use of a terrorist incident as a pretext for the realization of a government's political objectives, a number of examples come to mind. In 1914, the Austro-Hungarian monarchy exploited the opportunity provided by the assassination in Sarajevo of its archduke to issue an unacceptable ultimatum to Serbia and then go, as it had long planned, to war. In November 1938, a 17-year-old Polish-born Jewish refugee living in Paris by the name of Herschel Greenspan assassinated Ernst von Rath, a member of the German diplomatic corps. He carried out this act to protest the brutal anti-Jewish policies of the Nazi regime. The Nazis seized upon this desperate act by a young man to launch a violent anti-Jewish pogrom throughout Germany known as Kristallnacht. Over 100 Jews were murdered and 30,000 were seized and sent to concentration camps. Nearly 300 synagogues were destroyed and thousands of Jewish-owned businesses were looted. Many other incidents could be cited such as the attempted assassination in London on June 3, 1982, of the Israeli ambassador to Britain, Shlomo Argov. The Israeli government used this event as a pretext to launch a large-scale invasion of Lebanon, which it called Operation Peace for Galilee, whose goal was to establish a security zone in southern Lebanon. A consequence of this invasion was the massacre carried out in the Palestinian refugee camps known as Sabra and Shatila, located in Beirut. The massacres were carried out over a period of three days, from September 16th to 18th, by Lebanese Christian fascist militia allied with Israel. The fascists were allowed by Israeli forces who surrounded Beirut to enter the camps. Once inside, the fascists slaughtered with the explicit approval of Israeli Defense Minister and later Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, several thousand Palestinian refugees. That's a picture that was taken in one of the camps in the aftermath of the slaughter. I remember those events very well. Finally, there is the destruction of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001, a murky event explained as a so-called security lapse caused by a failure to connect the dots, which was used by the Bush administration to invade, as it had long planned, Afghanistan and Iraq, vastly expand the military operations of the United States throughout the Middle East and Central Asia, adopt the Israeli practice of targeted assassinations and, within the United States, create the Department of Homeland Security, increase the repressive power of the state, and erode the democratic rights of Americans. Notwithstanding the unstinting support for Israeli, Israel's invasion, amplified by a massive media propaganda campaign, the genocide has been met with a powerful international protest movement of unprecedented dimensions. I want to stress an international protest movement. Demonstrations of tens and even hundreds of thousands have been organized throughout the world. In an attempt to discredit the protests, Israel, the governments with which it is allied, and of course, Pro-Zionist organizations have denounced these demonstrations as anti-Semitic. This is a continuation 
and escalation of efforts over the last several decades to affix this label on all opponents of Israel's oppression of the Palestinians. Given the fact that people of Jewish extraction, and particularly Jewish youth, have played an exceptionally prominent role in the demonstrations, especially in the United States, which has the largest Jewish population outside of Israel, the allegation of anti-Semitism might seem simply absurd. Even worse, the fact that oppression to genocide is being identified as a result of relentless repetition as a manifestation of anti-Semitism, one can legitimately express the concern that the upshot of this reactionary misuse of the word will be the legitimization of anti-Jewish sentiment. The present day political motivations behind the smear campaign are obvious. But the significance of the allegations of anti-Semitism extend beyond its directly pragmatic application. The attribution of anti-Semitism to all opponents of the Israeli state is rooted in the philosophically irrationalist and national chauvinist ideology upon which the entire Zionist project has been based since its emergence as a significant political movement in the late 19th century. Having been gradually liberated in much of Western and, separ uh, in much of, much of Western and Central Europe from the confines of the ghetto by the spread of the Enlightenment, what was known among Jewish intellectuals of the time as Haskalah, and here is a picture of many of the figures who were active in the politics of uh, the Enlightenment and in the intellectual work of the Enlightenment. Not all of them, I believe, are Jewish, but I can't go through the names of each one. There is some outstanding historical work on the subject, I should add. But the spread of enlightenment in the 18th century, and particularly the political and social impact of the French Revolution, as a consequence of these processes, the Jewish intelligentsia and middle class associated social progress and the achievement of democratic rights with their assimilation rather than segregation from society. They wanted their religion to be viewed as a private matter and thus having no effect on their status as citizens with full democratic rights. A significant number of Jews increasingly identified their own striving for democratic rights as an element of and one which was subordinate to the broader and far more significant world historical struggle of the proletariat against the main cause of social oppression in the modern world, the capitalist system. Moreover, the proletarian struggle for socialism was intrinsically international and thus transcended and opposed the prioritization of any form of religious, ethnic, and national identity over the universal solidarity of the working class. It is for this reason that the attitude of the socialist movement to the Zionist movement, as it first emerged in the late 1880s and 1890s, was one of irreconcilable hostility. The initial assertion of the primacy of race over class, and in a sense the founding document of Zionism, was forcefully declared in Moses Hess's from Rome to Jerusalem, published in 1862, well in advance of the emergence of an actual Zionist movement. The first major figure to advance the perspective of a Jewish state in Palestine, Hess, who had earlier played a significant role in the early socialist movement of the 1840s, but who had been, had been uh, demoralized by the defeat suffered at the end of the decade, the defeat of the revolutions of 1848 and 49, declared in direct opposition to the perspective of Marx. And Hess knew Marx very well. He had worked with him in the early 1840s. 
and at one point had actually been a friend. He wrote, all history has been that of racial and class war. Racial wars are the primary, class wars the secondary factor. In Rome to Jerusalem, several essential elements of Zionist ideology are already present. The first, as stated in the statement that I have just quoted, is the prioritization of race over class. The second is Hess's insistence that the national state is the essential foundation of all political life and the indispensable framework for Jewish survival and progress. The Jewish popular masses, he wrote, will participate in the great historical movement of modern mankind only when it will have a Jewish homeland. The third essential element is the deeply demoralized and pessimistic conviction that Jews can never be assimilated in the existing European states. To believe that Jews can overcome persecution and achieve full emancipation to the struggle of the European working class for socialism was, Hess insisted, a delusion. He wrote, why fool ourselves? The European nations have always perceived the existence of Jews in their midst as an anomaly. We shall always be strangers among nations. The Germans hate less the Jewish religion than they hate their race. Neither religious reform nor baptism, neither enlightenment nor emancipation will open the gates of social life before the Jews. The fourth element was the conviction that the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine was only possible to the extent that it was seen to be beneficial to the interests of the major European powers. For Hess, living in the Europe of the 1860s, the main power was that of France, at least on the continent, which was then ruled by the reactionary dictatorship of the Emperor Louis Bonaparte. France, he wrote, quote, will help the Jews to found colonies which may extend from, Zue from Suez to Jerusalem and from the banks of the Jordan to the Mediterranean. In the 20th century, the Zionist movement would pursue its objectives by offering its services to the Turkish Sultan, the Russian Tsar, and somewhat later to British and finally American imperialism. Though it remained relatively unknown during his lifetime, Hess's From Rome to Jerusalem anticipated many of the conceptions that were to, defi to define the politics of the Zionist movement several decades later. Theodor Herzl later commented that if he had been familiar with Hess's book, it would not have been necessary for him to write his own Der Judenstaat, The Jewish State. <coughs> but it must be immediately noted that Herzl was intellectually inferior to Hess in every respect, and unlike the latter, who drifted back toward involvement in the socialist movement following the establishment of the First International, was hostile to socialism and an independent class-based workers' movement. The pogroms, violent anti-Jewish riots that erupted in the Russian Empire in 1881 and continued into 1882, with the support of the Tsarist regime, had a profound effect on the political outlook of broad sections of the Jewish population. These bloody events provided an impulse for an immense increase in political activity among Jews. It was during this period that Zionism, advancing the program of Jewish immigration to Palestine, first began to attract a significant following. But a far more powerful tendency was toward involvement of Jewish youth and workers in socialist politics. By the late 1890s, the principal manifestations of this activity were within the emerging Russian Social Democratic Labor Party and the Socialist Bund, which sought the independent political organization of Jewish workers on the basis of socialist politics. Both socialist tendencies were irreconcilably hostile to the Zionist movement, emphatically rejecting its claim to represent the interests of the Jewish people. Significantly, 
in the political struggle between Zionists and socialists, the sympathies of the Tsarist regime were entirely with the former, with the Zionists, which viewed the Zionists as an ally in the struggle against the increasingly dangerous influence of the socialist movement among Jewish youth. It sympathized with the aim of the Zionist project, the immigration of Jews from Russia to Palestine. The historian Yossi Goldstein, an Israeli, has written, I quote, the positive attitude of the authorities to the activities of the Zionist movement had far-reaching implications. Unlike their rivals in the Socialist Bund, Zionist activists did not have to maintain the secrecy which would have obstructed the spread of their movement. The dynamism characteristic of the years 1898 to 1900 were largely a function of the legitimation granted by authorities. They are thus opened up before the heads of the movement, the murshim, as they were called, and other organizers, a wide field of activity denied to other movements. This gave Zionism a significant advantage over its rivals in the competition to attract a following among the Jewish population. The present day claim that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism would have been dismissed as a vicious slander and even political lunacy at a time when thousands of Jewish workers and even substantial sections of the Jewish middle class intelligentsia directed their political energies toward the struggle for socialism. As Goldstein noted, and I quote, in Bund propaganda, the main stress was on class distinction, with Zionism representing the petty and middle bourgeoisie against the Bund, which represented the Jewish proletariat. The hostility of the Bund to Zionism was so deep and of such a fundamental character that at the Fourth Congress of the Bund in May 1901, quote, it was decided for the first time, as Goldstein writes, to launch a war to the death against Zionism. Bundes publications warned that, quote, Zionism is only a mask behind which to exploit the workers and deceive the toiling people. The Bund called upon its members to keep away from, quote, the hundreds of foul little creatures emerging from the rotten corpse of Zionism. This was written in 1904. And crawling toward the proletariat to get it to deviate from the path of the class struggle. The hostility of socialists to Zionism was to a great extent shared by broad sections of the Russian intelligentsia, who, as Goldstein wrote, attacked the Zionist movement and abhorred its ideals. Most of them desired its disappearance. The motives and the reasons for unanimous, for the unanimous anti-Zionist front of the Russian intelligentsia were rooted in the rationalism that determined the general theorizing of the intelligentsia in the early 20th century. For many, Zionism was still, by way of being utopian, bound up with the yearnings for Zion and Jewish eschatological thinking outside the rational, intellectual world. Herzl and his like in Western Europe were regarded as allies of Jewish orthodoxy rather than as the offspring of Western Enlightenment. The anti-Zionism of all factions of the socialist movement prevented the Zionists from making serious inroads into the working class. From the outset, Goldstein writes at the conclusion of his historical essay, the Zionist movement attracted mainly members of the Jewish middle class. The Zionists never acquired the mass base necessary for the success of their reactionary colonization project until the catastrophe of the Holocaust placed at their disposal several hundred thousands of desperately persecuted and stateless people, survivors of Nazi genocide. Now, there is no period of history prior to the founding of Israel in 1948 that has so thoroughly exposed the reactionary character of Zionism 
and his fraudulent claim to represent the interests of the Jewish people than its conduct during the 1930s. The extent of the political and commercial dealings of the Nazis and Zionists has been extensively documented by historians. Many of the most important works on this subject have been written by Jewish historians, among whom the most renowned are Saul Friedlander and Tom Segev. In the aftermath of Hitler's accession to power, the Zionist organizations were inclined to collaborate with the Nazis, even arguing that both Nazism and Zionism were national movements whose Völkisch principles, populist principles, were compatible. Opposing mass protests or an economic boycott against the Nazi regime, Zionist representatives from Germany and Palestine met with representatives of the Third Reich and concluded on August 27, 1933, a financial agreement known as the Havara, which, as explained by Friedlander, allowed Jewish immigrants indirect transfer of part of their assets and facilitated export of goods from Nazi Germany to Palestine. Friedlander continued, one of the main benefits the new regime hoped to reap from Havara was a breach in the foreign Jewish economic boycott of Germany. The Zionist organizations and the leadership of the Yeshuv, the Jewish community in Palestine, distanced themselves from any form of mass protest or boycott to avoid creating obstacles to the new arrangements. Even before the conclusion of the Havara Agreement, such cooperation sometimes took bizarre forms. Thus, in early 1933, Baron Leopold Itz Edler von Milderstein, a man who a few years later was to become chief of the Jewish section of the SC, the Sicherheitsdienst, or security service, the SS intelligence branch headed by Reinhard Heydrich, was, a, was invited along with his wife to tour Palestine and write a series of articles for Goebbels' Der Angriff. And so it was that the Mildersteins, accompanied by Kurt Tuchler, a leading member of the Berlin Zionist organization, and his wife, visited Jewish settlements in Eretz Israel. The highly positive articles entitled A Nazi Visits Palestine were duly published and to mark the occasion, a special medallion cast with a swat sticker on one side and a Star of David on the other. It sounds unbelievable, but it happened. On June 22nd, 1933, the leaders of the Zionist Organization for Germany sent a memorandum to Hitler which declared, Zionism believes that the rebirth of the national life of a people, which is now occurring in Germany through its emphasis on its Christian and national character, must also come about among the Jewish people. For the Jewish people too, national origin, religion, common destiny, and a sense of uniqueness must be of decisive importance to its existence. The demands, this demands the elimination of the egotistical individualism of the liberal era and its replacement with a sense of community and collective responsibility. Now by June 1933, tens of thousands of social democrats and communists had already been rounded up by the Nazis. Dachau, the first major concentration camp, was already filling up with prisoners. The trade unions had been abolished. The Enabling Act had been passed. There had been the Reichstag fire. There was a reign in terror underway in Germany. The Zionist leaders were writing what can only be described as a love letter to Adolf Hitler, trying to explain to him that he should perhaps Take a second look at the Zionist movement. Maybe they were not that far apart. They had similar aims of a folkish character. Now later, 
The apologists for Zionists would attempt to explain away such statements and the Havara as survival measures undertaken under desperate conditions, as if the triumph of fascism justifies collaboration. In fact, the response of the Zionists to the brutal persecution of the Jews by the Nazis, and even to their murder, was determined by calculations of its effect on the prospects for Jewish emigration into Palestine. As David Ben-Gurion, the leader of the Zionist movement, infamously declared in 1938, if I knew that it was possible to save all the Jewish children in Germany by transporting them to England, but only half of them by transporting them to Palestine, I would choose the second because we faced not only the reckoning of those children, but the historical reckoning of the Jewish people. Ben-Gurion also expressed the fear, following the Kristallnacht program, pogrom, that the event might lead to international sympathy for the plight of the Jews, resulting in various countries relaxing their restrictions on immigration and thereby offering Jews alternatives to Palestine. However, the sympathy expressed by the Zionist organizations for Nazism cannot be merely explained as a manifestation of cowardice and grotesque tactical opportunism. Zionism, which emerged as an offspring of imperialist colonialism and as an enemy of socialism and a scientific conception of history and society, necessarily based itself on the most reactionary elements of nationalist politics and ideology. In an epoch in which the driving forces of social progress had become the revolutionary struggle of the international working class against capitalism and the bourgeois national state, Zionism based its program on the glorification of the national principle as the essential foundation of Jewish existence. All conceptions of history stemming from the Enlightenment and the later socialist movement with the development of Marxism that undermined the principle of national exclusivity, especially those which on the basis of science and reason viewed national identity as a historically limited and transitory phenomenon connected to a specific stage in the development of the productive forces and their relationship to the world market, were thereby denounced as incompatible with Zionism, not only as a political program, but also as the sole expression of Jewish identity. To deny the legitimacy of Zionism was therefore implicitly and explicitly to deny the right of Jews to exist. That's the origin of the argument that any opposition to Israel is by its very nature anti-Semitic. From this follows the insidious claim that opposition to Zionism, even if the opponent is a Jew, is anti-Semitic. In a book titled the Metaphysical Origins of Antisemitism, published in 2015 by the Cambridge University Press. Professor David Patterson, professor of history at the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies at the University of Texas in Dallas, justifies the slander on the basis of a defense of a religious myth and irrationalism. He asserts, that the source of the modern of modern day antisemitism must be traced back to the Enlightenment and especially the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. He writes, the doctrines of the Enlightenment were engendered by a mode of thought that was inherently antisemitic. If it is to be true to itself, the philosophy of the Enlightenment has to be anti-Semitic. If human freedom lies in human autonomy 
And if human autonomy lies in being self-legislating, as Kant maintains, then one realizes that nothing threatens self-legislating human autonomy more than the commanding voice of Mount Sinai, the voice that undermines the modern view that Kant, that Kant espouses and that the world now embraces. What is he saying? If you do not believe, if you challenge the view that everything that takes place is determined by God, by a holy force, if you believe that human beings can make decisions on the basis of reason, on the basis of conscious action, you are, and I'm sure this will come as a shock to many of you, you are anti-Semite. Patterson continues, Indeed, if one adopts the premise of the Enlightenment that there can be no people apart but only a universal humanity grounded in reason, then one must necessarily assume an anti-Semitic position. Losing the fatherhood of God, we lose the brotherhood of humanity. Once God is superfluous, so is the human being superfluous. So is the Jewish state not only superfluous but dangerous. For the left-wing intellectual anti-Zionist, the modern history of thinking God out of the picture culminates in removing the Zionist state from the map. Now these words do not appear in a Christian evangelical fundamentalist paperback of the sort that are widely sold in American pharmacies. This appeared under the imprimatur of the Cambridge University Press among the most prestigious publishing houses in the world. It testifies not only to the utterly reactionary character of Zionism, but to the far advanced political, social, intellectual, and moral putrefaction of a capitalist system that is rooted in the nation-state system. Herein lies the broader significance of the intransigent solidarity of all the imperialist powers with the Israeli state. In defending Israel, they're defending themselves. They're defending the national principle. They're defending national oppression. They're defending religious obscuritism. All the elements of reaction in the world are concentrated in the response of imperialism to this atrocity. There are, of course, pragmatic geopolitical interests that determine the support of the United States and its NATO allies for Israel's war against the Palestinian people. But underlying this united front against the Palestinians is the recognition that their democratic aspirations, which require the dissolution of the Israeli state and the creation of a new binational federation, threatens not only the interests of imperialism in the Middle East, but the entire historically obsolete state structure of imperialist geopolitics and capitalist rule. Neither the oppression of the Palestinian people, nor for that matter the historic and still very real issue of anti-Semitism, to the extent that that term is properly used, can be solved within the framework of the capitalist system and its nation state. Imperialism and created the Israeli state, did not solve the Jewish problem. It exploited and took advantage of the immense tragedy of the Holocaust, one of imperialism's greatest crimes for its own purposes. And from the start, the Fourth International opposed the creation of the Israeli state. And it should also be added that it was the Socialist Workers' Party alone which throughout World War II conducted an unrelenting campaign for the admission of Jews into the United States, something which was opposed by the Roosevelt administration and virtually the entire political establishment. Today's concentration on the war in Gaza is certainly justified by the scale of the crime which is being committed against its people. 
But we must understand that the struggle to end the genocide vindicates and imparts the greatest urgency to the central perspective and raison d'etre of the International Committee of the Fourth International, the struggle for world socialist revolution. There exists no other answer to the terminal crisis of the capitalist system. Summing up the significance of the 1953 split in the Fourth International, Cannon wrote, it is a question of the development of the international revolution and the socialist transformation of society. Confronted with the genocide in Gaza, the war in Ukraine, the danger of escalation toward global nuclear war, the attacks on democratic rights, the staggering levels of social inequality, the uncontrolled spread of the pandemic and the threat of ecological disaster. The International Committee turns to the expanding mass movement of youth and workers throughout the world and states emphatically, the task with which you are confronted is the development of the international revolution and the socialist transformation of society. And that is why you must join, build, and fight for the development of the International Committee of the Fourth International in Britain and throughout the world. Thank you very much.